So we want to combine the concept of oscillation with the idea of stable. And how do we put those two together? The first example of someone who really understood this and put them together was in a very interesting context. It was in the context of music. Now, what is a musical instrument? A musical instrument is a physical device for producing an oscillation. And that oscillation is the musical note. So here is an actual record, uh, a very short record. This is in seconds. And it's a record of a guitar playing the A chord at 440 cycles per second. And this is our recording of it. And you will notice that 7.15 to 7.16, that's a hundredth of a second. And in a hundredth of a second, we have one, two, three, four, uh, excuse me, one, two, three, four, and change. And that's exactly the 440 cycles. And the guitar issues this periodic signal. You will also see that it's not a simple round sine wave. It has a regular uh, a scalloping in it. And that scalloping is what makes the guitar playing a 440 sound like a guitar playing a 440, as opposed to, for example, a piano playing A440, which is going to have the same frequency, namely 440, uh, but it's going to have a different waveform because the piano does not sound like a guitar. Now, the critical thing about a musical instrument like a guitar or a piano is that the frequency of the note that you hear, the frequency of the note that it plays, cannot depend upon how hard you strike the key or the string. That would be a terrible musical instrument. If you pluck a little harder, what you want is the same frequency, the same waveform, because you want it to sound like a guitar, and a higher amplitude, because you struck it harder. So it turns out that that's exactly what we are talking about, about a stable oscillation, where the frequency is independent of the amplitude with which you struck it. So of course, that's not a property of the shark tuna system. If you give a small initial condition, you in the shark tuna system, you have one, two, three, four oscillations. If you give a larger perturbation, you have a different frequency. So this would be a terrible musical instrument. So Lord Rayleigh was a gentleman scientist in late 19th century Britain. And he started to think about the physics of musical instruments. How can musical instruments be designed to not have this property, but to give you a consistent frequency and, and waveform that was stable? So he started to think, and he started to think about the clarinet as an example. And he made a physical and then a mathematical model of how the clarinet works. Basically, the idea is that without the clarinetist, what do we have here? The reed of the clarinet is like a spring. And the spring is exerting itself right here. 
And if you perturbed that reed to here, it would yo-yo back and forth due to the spring element. And then it has friction and air resist in, in the form of air resistance. And so that oscillation would eventually die out. In other words, without the clarinetist, we have a spring with friction. Without the clarinetist, it's just a spring. And the spring has friction in the form of air resistance. So that takes us back to our model of the spring. You remember the apparatus? There's a mass spring on a cart here. And the spring takes it back and forth. And you also see this element of the dash pot just immediately below the spring. The dash pot is a friction element. As the piston has to move through a fluid, it creates friction. And so this is the physical model of the spring with friction. And we make a differential equation out of that, as you saw, by realizing that this is mechanics, and so we have two kinds of state variables, positions and velocities. So we have an x and a v. And then we make the differential equation x prime equals v, which is automatic in mechanics. And v prime, also known as acceleration, v prime is equal to the sum of the forces. That's Newton's law, also known as F equals ma. But here it's v prime equals sum of forces. And the forces on the spring are two kinds of forces. There's the spring force, which is driving it back and forth. And there's the friction force, which is damping it. And so we make a very simple graph of the spring force. It's minus x. We make a very simple assumption about friction, which is that it's linear. And so we have a linear spring and linear friction. And that goes into this differential equation model. And when we analyze this differential equation model, we see this trajectory, the spiraling in to the stable equilibrium point at x equals 0, v equals 0. And that's, of course, what you expect from a spring with friction. It will oscillate in a damped oscillation and will eventually go to 0. So this is the spring with friction this is the clarinetist, the clarinet, excuse me, without the clarinetist. So then Rayleigh goes on and he says, now let's put the clarinetist into the picture. What is the clarinetist going to do? So Rayleigh asks, how do we model the effect of the clarinetist. And his idea was that the cla what is the clarinetist doing? It's blowing on the reed, and that is producing a driving away from the equilibrium point. If the reed is here in its oscillation, and you are blowing on it this way, that's going to drive it even further. And if you're down in this mode and you're blowing on it this way, that's going to drive it down even further. So blowing on a reed like that produces an unstable equilibrium point because the slightest deviation means that the wind is going to drive it this way. And the slightest deviation that way means the wind is going to drive it that way. So an object being blown on by a wind along its long axis is in an unstable equilibrium. 
it's like a door in the wind. A little bit of opening will cause the wind to catch it to open it further, which means more wind catches it, which opens it even further, which means more wind catches it. It's a positive feedback driving you away from the equilibrium point. So Rayleigh says, okay, what is this? This driving you away from the unstable equilibrium point, that's the opposite of friction, which takes you back to the stable equilibrium point. And he says, we're going to model the clarinetist as producing negative friction for small velocities, for low velocities. The blowing creates a negative friction and excites the system. And so the result of that, here is the good old spring with good old friction over here. And what you see is that the good old spring with good old friction produces a stable equilibrium point at zero. Now we're going to take the same spring force, but this negative friction force. And we're going to put the negative friction force into that same differential equation. And it's going to do exactly what you think it's going to do. It's going to create an unstable equilibrium point driving the system away from the equilibrium point. But that's low velocities. At very high velocities, now air resistance, due to the high frequency of the oscillation, air resistance becomes the dominant force, much stronger than the clarinetist blowing. And because air resistance is the dominant force at large velocities, now we need to somehow make a function that's going to give us negative friction at low velocities and positive friction at high velocities. So Rayleigh says, how are we going to do this? We make this graph of there's velocity on the x-axis and what is this friction force, what is the action of the spring going to be? And we want negative friction at small v, and we want positive friction at large v. So how are we going to do that? How are we going to stitch together those three red lines? Well, Rayleigh said, hey, Here's a very simple, smooth function that incorporates negative friction at low velocities and positive friction at high velocities. And there is, our, there is the shape of our friction function. Now, we want to put this into the differential equation as the friction term. And so we need a mathematical expression for that curve. And Rayleigh was a good enough mathematician to say, well, here's a perfectly good example. The simplest form of a function that satisfies our requirements is a function like v cubed minus v. So notice that for small v, v less than 1, v cubed is very small compared to v. And so the slope is minus v. It's, it's good old negative friction. Whereas at large velocities, the v cubed term dominates. And that gives you good old positive friction. So the v cubed minus v term goes in very nicely into the differential equation. There is our new differential equation. Here is our spring function. Here is our friction function. And now we simulate this differential equation 
and we see a completely new kind of behavior that is not seen, for example, in the shark tuna. What is that behavior? Well, there is this red loop here, and you will notice that it is closed. So a closed orbit is a periodic signal, is a periodic uh, function in the state variables. If you graphed the state, if you graphed the values of x and v as the state point moved around the loop, you would see x going up and down, you would see v going up and down as functions of time. When you graph them in the state space, it's especially clear that this is a closed loop, that the closed loop means this is an oscillation, and you can do some more experiments. You choose an initial condition inside the loop, and you follow it, and it follows, it goes out to the red loop, it approaches that red loop asymptotically, and eventually just goes around and around, indistinguishable from the red loop. If you start with an initial condition outside the red loop, or if you perturb off the red loop to an initial condition outside the red loop, the state point comes back to the red loop and approaches it asymptotically and goes around and around the red loop. So this is a big deal, and Rayleigh realized that he had found something. He knew, he didn't do computer simulations, needless to say. So he had to be very, very smart he could not say there is a red loop. Uh, this is a result of a very nice Python program that we wrote to do this. But he didn't have that. He had to reason mathematically. And what he said was, I know that for large V, we spiral in. I know that for small v, we spiral out. I conclude that trapped in between the spiraling in and the spiraling out, there must be a closed orbit that is the limit of both of those. That's very smart. <laughs> he was right. He was reasoning sort of physically, geometrically, and this was proved 30 or 40 years later by Poincaré that yes, indeed, there is a single closed curve there that is the limit of the spiraling in process and also the limit of the spiraling out process. So this is a stable oscillation. And this is what gives the clarinet its note. Now you'll notice that the red loop in this case is not perfectly round. If it were perfectly round, the sound, the tone quality, would be like a tuning fork. Tuning forks exhibit perfectly sinusoidal oscillations. The shape, the non-circular shape of this trajectory means that it has overtones that give it what musicians call the timbre, that, that give it the sound that makes it a guitar or a piano. So this red loop signifies the sound of the instrument. The shape of the red loop is the sound of this instrument. 
So Rayleigh decided to do a little experiment. Remember what we said. If you strike harder, you don't want a different frequency and you don't want a different waveform. You just want a bigger amplitude. So he did that experiment. That is, he considered blowing harder. So what's blowing harder? Well, the spring force is the same. But then he said, you know what I'm, how I'm going to model blowing harder? I'm going to change the dotted friction function to the solid friction function, which is wider. So the negative friction regime ends here, not here. The negative friction regime is bigger when you blow harder. So it's very easy to write the mathematical model for that expanded friction function. And when you write that mathematical model and you put it into the equation, you see that the old dotted friction function gives you the dotted oscillation. And the expanded blowing harder friction function gives you exactly what you hoped, which is same shape, same frequency, different amplitude. So Rayleigh, by coming up with a physical mathematical model for a musical instrument, also came up with the first model for a stable oscillation. So this is a big deal. We now have our first model of a stable oscillation, which is combining two things that have a little tension with each other. But we have now successfully, we, that is Rayleigh, successfully combined them and showed you how to get a stable oscillation.